Okay, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna kick off. Um, and uh, now that now that we've got a lot a lot of people on the call, um, please do carry on um, in, uh, introducing yourself in the chat. I just wanted to flag um, the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom, um, right at the bottom there of the screen. Um, we have a Q and A sec section at the end, and we are really keen to get your questions. So please do put your questions into that Q and A, and you can also write them and. Um, so that we can um, we can make sure that we answer those um, and and the panel will um, yeah we'll endeavour to get to get all of those answered by the end of the session. Um, so yeah, so welcome everyone, and um, we have some excellent speakers um, on a very important topic today. Um, I'll let our speakers introduce themselves um, as they begin to speak. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to set the scene. Um, so um, at the start of this decade, um, we had the UN declared as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, um, and that was um, urging countries to restore 1 billion hectares of land. Um, unfortunately, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, um, at the rate that we're currently seeing, only 5% of that will be achieved. So obviously we need to speed up restoration exponentially. Um, today, specifically, we're going to talk about how restoration and restoration projects affect the people who live on and near the land which is being restored. Um, so you can see some really impressive and daunting facts um, up on the screen at the moment. Um, for example, 1.6 billion people relying on forests for their livelihoods and 14.3% of lands um, owned by Indigenous and local communities. Um, you know, we have a lot of projects and project developers claiming to want to maximize the social benefits and integrate local communities into their projects, but we all know that that's not that straightforward. Um, so we're hoping that this webinar can address some of the challenges and share some best practices. Um, I wanted to start with getting some context from Sabella Santana. Um, so um, Sabella, could you please introduce yourself and um, the Gedje de Sementes de Sacado, um, and just explain from your perspective how and why local communities get involved in restoration projects. Sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am Sibeli from Head de Cemento do Cerrado, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, well, I'm graduated in administration, and I have been working at the institution since 2018, taking care of institutional management and financial aspects of projects in general. Uh, but talking about the institution, Head de Cemento do Cerrado is an NGO that started in 2001 and was funded by the Brazilian National Environment Fund, which led to the creation of eight seed network across the biomes in all the country. Uh, this specific program was proposed by a department of the University of Brazilian, and it was a pioneer in mobilizing and training people for seed collection and production of native seedlings and seeds. Um, yet it was only in 2004 that the institution was formalized as a private nonprofit civil association. So over these 20 years, our, our work has become a reference for Cerrado conservation and the production of native species seeds. We work together and collaborate with governmental institution and academia through scientific research. Uh, but in general, our mission is to promote the conservation of social biodiversity by creating, exchanging, uh, disseminating knowledge and establishing partnerships with academic institutions, government and society as well. Uh, well, besides that, the work contributes with practical and innovative solutions to the inclusive ecological restoration chain from the seed collection to public policies, um, helping to provide better living opportunities for the Sahado people and delivering social, environmental and economic benefits to society as a whole. Um, we focus on first research related to seeds and restoration, of course, and two, acting as a bridge, connecting various stakeholders and emphasizing the visibility of Cerrado peoples and communities. Um, so when talking about the work with these communities, we include them in all restoration chain processes, 
uh, the collection is entirely done by the communities and we strive to structure their training and inclusion in our restoration projects so they can execute all phases from diagnosis, um, restoration planning, um, understanding degradation factors, soil preparation, planting, maintenance, monitoring, everything. And all of this happens with the support uh, and assistance of our technicians, mostly when projects are in the territories or the regions where the communities live. So we train the collections through our courses and um, our courses on collection and processing. Uh, and we produce videos, uh, booklets and restoration manuals and build knowledge together. And we also create jobs um, and income opportunity for these communities. So we can call this methodology inclusive restoration because we ensure active community participation. And uh, um, since the communities have a connection to the territories and the areas that are being restored and participate in all states, the likelihood of their continued involvement and long-term long -term actions increases a lot the success of these restorations. Um, but finally, to summarize, in terms, in terms of numbers, uh, we currently work with around uh, 140 species of native Cerrado seeds, uh, seven beneficiary groups, around 520 collectors, of whom 317 are women, and we have produced over 70 tons of seeds and have restored around 500 hectares. Super, thanks so much, Sibili. Um, That's really helpful context. Um, I, I wonder, please, if um, Bruno um, and then um, uh, Amira and then Catherine could briefly um, ex introduce yourselves as well um, and explain the why behind this. So why why should we involve local communities? Why is that important? Um, why um, having projects led by local communities um, is important? If you could just um, give us your perspective on that briefly, um, and then we will um, uh, yeah we'll get started on the, on the kind of challenges part of of the webinar. Thank you, Jane. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you, Morpho, for this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to, to share this webinar with you guys, Emira, Catherine, Sibeli. Thank you, Jen, for moderating us. Uh, well, I'm Bruno. I'm from, I'm here in Sao Paulo. I'm a Brazilian and I'm a sociologist. I graduated in, in France and I, where I had also a, a master's degree in geopolitics. And after a first uh, period of my life in Europe, I came back to Brazil. And um, the last 15 years, I've been working in the developing, uh, development projects, uh, the, the territorial development projects. Um, and a few years ago, I created with uh, my partner, Carol, uh, an institution called Humana. And we, in Umana, we work uh, in large scale projects, not uh, specifically in rest, forest restoration, but in different sectors, uh, all the sectors that are impacting and transforming territories all around Brazil and also Latin America. So we are in this kind of context, promoting uh, partnerships between private sector, public sector, um, and civil society to implement uh, actions and projects that will um, promote a more sustainable uh, development on the ground around around these large scale projects in different sectors. And we have in these partnerships a territorial approach. Maybe after I will be able to explain a little bit what it means and suppose to have this territorial approach and how, why it's important. But uh, answering to your uh, question, Jen, maybe first insights about how, why it's important to engage uh, communities in all large scale projects, and maybe even more in um, uh, 
uh, forest restoration projects, you know, uh, because, well, I think if we are talking about uh, a contribution to, to the sustainability of the world, uh, of course, uh, in the first first uh, way, uh, helping the world to face uh, the climate change uh, crisis and emergency, but we cannot talk about a sustainability and sustainable development without uh, considering two uh, two things, I, two factors. I I, I think uh, one more like an uh, an ethical factor of that. I mean, if we cannot contribute to uh, uh, with a project that will help the world, the world, all the, the world to 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 face this climate crisis, uh, but without uh, addressing some very social um, uh, issues that we still have around in these territories uh, and specifically in Brazil, in Latin America, and in a lot of countries um, where the tropical forests are. So uh, I think there is an ethical thing to, to, to put in this uh, equation. Uh, we cannot save the world, in the same, but in the same time, have a, a, a negative impact uh, in, the, in the local level. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a very uh, uh, a pragmatic uh, factor too, because at the support of uh, the community around any large scale project, it's a factor of success of this project. If you don't have the support, if you have uh, uh, a social and economical contradictions very present, it's a, a source of conflicts. And then it's also in a pragmatic way, uh, uh, we, you are like uh, feeding future problems and conflicts. If you don't deal with that, at the beginning, engaging people, explaining to people, and building uh, um, uh, a governance of all this process with the communities. And so there is this ethical and pra pragmatic factor that I think it's very important when you talk about uh, uh, community engagement in large-scale projects. Thanks, Bruno. That's um, yeah, ethical and pragmatic. Very, very important. Um, okay, um, uh, Amira, perhaps you could go next and and uh, just give your thoughts on um, shaping that that why that we're talking about. So thank you very much. So I I am glad to be here and delighted to share this uh, webinar with all of you, Sibel, Kat Catherine, Bruno. So it's uh, it's amazing, and thank you very much, Jane, for moderating us. Um, so to start, so to present a bit my, myself, so I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Morpho and uh, I come from, um, from public research and I spend uh, all my career working on the diversity of um, ecological and agroeconomic relevant species um, in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in, in South America. And we're saying that the, um, the local communities are uh, important. It's maybe an understatement. They are the cornerstone of any deployment of any kind of research or findings we can find. Because it, it is important to engage them and to hear what they need. Because when we talk about ecological species or agroeconomical species, Issues, you cannot say that without having local communities in mind. So it's, it is very important to have them in the middle of the thinking, but also in the middle of the deployment. And it's very interesting, for example, today to have this diversity also of backgrounds, the science, the research, the, the, the social vision, the economic vision, um, the organization. So it's, it's very important because it's a whole. It's not one point and it's, a, it's an action of everyone but having these uh, communities in the heart of the thinking because the success is quite linked to, to these people and we will have time to, to talk about it. But it's very important when we are thinking about forest 
um, restoration, ecological restoration. There is people behind it and there is people around it. And it's very important to have them in mind and more than in mind to have them with us on the field. Thanks, Samira. Catherine, could you add your, your thoughts? Yeah, of course. Um, well, thank you so much for the invitation today. I'm really excited to be here and especially with these panelists and just learn from each other as we go as well. So I am a postdoctoral researcher with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. So it's a branch of the Smithsonian, which is a research and museum organization in the United States. Um, we've been in Panama for over 100 years. I personally identify myself as a restoration ecologist coming from both an ecology perspective and an economics perspective. So I really am interested in these discussions about how to make forest restoration work on the ground with people um, because previously I've been mostly, you know, um, in the field sort of alone or in the office analyzing data from that perspective and only in the last five years have started to participate in forest restoration with communities on the ground. And that's been really amazing. Um, to go on to your question, I mean, um, I, Bruno and Amira couldn't have said it better, how important it is to work with people. And I think it's, I'll say something that's probably very obvious, especially to the people on this call and the people on this panel, but perhaps is a misconception that I often hear from people in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, is that in the tropics, there are people on the land. And often it's this assumption that the tropics is, you know, full of land that isn't claimed by people. And so just that alone requires us to be really considering and people, as Amira said, as the cornerstone. And then just from my own experience collaborating with people in different groups um, and from the science perspective, I think working with people to, to design projects and to do the research, you get a lot more buy-in from people and communities and they see the research they're doing um, come to fruition and they learn from the answers from that research. So for example, we collaborate with the Panama Canal Authority's environmental division. They're responsible for managing the land around the Panama Canal. And that collaboration over 15 years, we, we bring them out to the field and we work with them on these projects and they see with their own eyes how there are different ways to restore forests. And then they go and they implement that. And so I think that's like a very clear example too of how um, important it is to be working hand in hand in collaboration with people. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everybody, for um, for your thoughts on that. And um, yeah, I think it is really important that we we really frame it in, in the importance and how how critical it is um, that local communities are, are part of any any sort of restoration efforts. Um, um, so once now we've uh, we've we've made that very clear. Um, I wanted to dive into the challenges. Um, we've identified four main challenges, um, and um, uh, I'm sure we'll come across more um, as we go. Um, but um, and and perhaps even through the Q and A at the end. And in fact, while I'm on Q and A, just to remind everybody, if you want to, if you've got a question, there's a little button at the bottom of your Zoom which says Q and A. If you just put it in there, um, and then we'll get to it when we when we get to that part. Um, but yes, we'll um, uh, we've so we've got these um, these four challenges um, uh, that we are. I think it's just coming up now. Yeah, here we go. Um, that we've identified and that we're really going to focus on. And this is the meat of our of our webinar today. Um, we um, we wanted to start start with the first. And, and Bruno, perhaps you could give us um, some um, some context and, and start us off here. Um, what are the first steps um, a project developer should take to determine land rights um, and ensure proper free free prior um, and informed consent, consent, which people often call FPIC, um, has taken place? Well, maybe maybe just allow me give a step back to this because this. 
I think this is very useful to understand uh, how uh, a territorial approach is important. And, and in, 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 I, I, as I understand, in sometimes in academics knowledge, you have uh, this distinction between a landscape approach and a territorial approach. And, and in, in the meaning, a territorial approach, it would be more focused in livelihoods and social issues, economic issues, and uh, a landscape approach more maybe uh, an ecological uh, issues and biophysical things. But uh, personally, in my practice uh, as, a, as a practitioner, I, I'm, I'm not sure this, this distinction is very useful nowadays in, our, in this kind of context we are operating. So uh, for to understand, answering to your question then about uh, FPIC, I think the most important thing to do at the beginning, it's really to, it, maybe it's, it sounds like a little bit obvious, but it's really important to focus on that in mapping everything you have on this territory, especially uh, the institutions present there. And when I take uh, and I talk about institutions, it's not only the state. How the state is present, it's very, very important because in general, if the states are very have a very weak presence, we will have some rights being violated, probably. But if even if you have the state presence there, what what kind of uh, other institutions do you have? Do you have uh, NGOs? from uh, abroad, NGOs from outside the territory? Do you have uh, civil associations representing these communities there? They are strong, they are weak. No, so map all this universe that exists on a territory. It's the first step and it, it's like doing a very small work like uh, uh, listening uh, rounds with all the actors, first a bilateral uh, listening process to be, to be, to be sure uh, what is the political uh, situation to the different groups, who is representing who. And this all this is very fragile, this balance sometimes. So you have to take care not in your in your good intentions to do a very large and huge, an inclusive uh, audience and and the consent process has to be large. But the first step, you have to go and uh, uh, walk on this territory very carefully. And and these institutions uh, maps are very important. Here in Brazil, for example, a lot of uh, uh, communities are represented by very strong associations. They have their own consent uh, protocols. So um, in the other side, you have very, very fragile and vulnerable uh, territories where uh, different kind of uh, political pressures on that. So you have to understand what's the situation there. As you know, uh, Brazil signed um, the convention about FPIC and uh, uh, integrated to its law uh, years ago, but there is no uh, clear regulamentation about that. So there is a lot of different protocols, and for a for a project operator or developer, uh, it's important to consider what what there is in this state, in this municipality, in this region, this community. How, because there is no national regulation that will help you. So, uh, yeah, you have to do your own job and 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 map all these elements to be to be sure that you are you can. Uh, go further. Thanks, Bruno. That's really, yeah, that's really helpful to give us that sort of um, high level view um, and, um, and and first steps. Um, uh, I want to follow up by asking um, uh, Sibele a, a few questions, actually. Um, and if you can't get them all in your head, no worries. I, I will ask <laughs> again. But um, how do we engage with um, with local communities equitably? And, and I think that word is really it's really important. Um, um, how is um, RSC com compensating um, the local workers? Um, how does the model evolve? Um, and, and can you give us some of your recommendations for developing the right compensation model? Okay. 
Um, well, we work with family farming associations and cooperatives and traditional peoples and communities. Um, so, for example, the price per kilo of seeds is set by the collectors in an assembly that is performed every year with the participation of all associated collections. So collection payments are really decided based on the principle of associativism and cooperation. They establish the seed prices based on how difficult it is to collect and process the seeds and the money returns to them. Um, besides that, when they participate in restoration projects performing technical functions, they are paid according to market prices and the resources available in the work plan of each project. The same way uh, in the inclusive restoration projects I mentioned before, the restoration budget is built from the ground up where local wisdom, restoration planning, costs, um, strategies and contracts are discussed together with these communities. Um, and we believe that when we talk about equity, decisions and constructions must be made from the bottom up, not the other way around, as it is very, it's, it is done very often. So, uh, of course, we don't have a ready-made recipe. And over the years, we have understood that um, working with communities presents many, many challenges such as the need for structuring, uh, more monitoring, continuous process and protocol building, um, training sessions uh, ranging from technical aspects to issues like associativism, grassroots work, uh, social dialogue and uh, internal communication and so many things. But uh, most importantly, we always must remember to balance different understandings, um, different learning times, expectations, and perceptions, because working with collectives requires um, tolerance, patience, and of course, empathy. Thanks, that's super helpful. And Amira, I'm so sorry that um, I think I missed your hand. Do you want to come in next and um, and just comment? I think you had something on Bruno and perhaps you want to follow on as well from Sibylla and, um, uh, and explain just, um, it would be good to know as well as part of your uh, answer, how, how much finance um, from restoration projects can actually come back to the communities? Like how, how does the model work? So thank thank you, Jean. Yeah, I, I had a um, a question for for Bruno, but at the end it's the same question. Hearing uh, this 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 these challenges we have in this uh, inclusive restoration and involving people, regulation and all the um, I would say the the environment around the the process. So my question is is I don't know if there is an answer, but it's more uh, at this. For the discussion, um, as we are here from different backgrounds, with taking part in this play of restoration from different part, how can be the solution? How can these actors and us as an actor organize to make this challenge a less of a challenge? I would not say remove it 100%, but make it a less of a challenge because I think there is, as we are. A lot of actors in this field it's a way to organize and a way to act that will make a lot of challenges less big and this one so my, my question at the end how can we organize all of us and do to make it to find a solution in front of this this challenge so i don't know guys what you think about it Yeah, does anyone want to jump in on that? Catherine, maybe? Um, are you asking a little bit, Amira, about how do we get all of us from different backgrounds in the same room and communicating? Um, same room and, and same action, because same room, I think it's quite easy to do it, but the same action and impactful action with all the play we are playing in this, uh, in this scene. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably it. 
I would love to hear from Bruno and Sibele as well, but I think that is a huge challenge. And I think um, one of the challenges is almost um, the way we communicate and the language we use, because when we come from different fields, we might use the same word very differently. And we might not even realize that a word has a really different meaning amongst us. And I am really lucky, like from a research perspective, I come from a very interdisciplinary background. And so you be kind of become multilingual in these different fields, but of course there's always limitations to that. But I've noticed just having groups that come together regardless of the background, but really trying to communicate, understand, define things and try to come to common definitions is like a really good starting point for then being able to tackle some of these problems. But I'm curious what other people's perspectives are as well. Yeah, to de-jargonize things, right? <laughs> as much as possible. Um, yeah, Bruno or, or Sibella, do you want to jump in? Maybe maybe just, uh, uh, I don't have a solution, uh, as, as, as you can imagine, uh, but I maybe some ideas. Um, I think there is, a way still uh, to go where, for example, uh, if there there is there is different uh, protocols and standards and rules how to do the forest restoration in this in the in the uh, regarding biodiversity regarding the species regarding all this. You no, know, you have this is quite a, quite a, a well built and very very uh, straight and okay. There is. But maybe there is something to build uh, about about uh, this. What what we will do around these projects, and that, that there is maybe it's not yet. It's a process, so it's normal that it's like that. But maybe putting together different actors, the private actors, they have different roles, and the, the public actors too, they have different kind of roles, and maybe we have to build something that can be a reference. To understand, okay, in this kind of situations, we are maybe even between two operators, we are maybe competitors, or uh, in, in, in this business, we'll, there is also competition and that's in everything. So, okay, we are competitors, uh, uh, we have this different stage of public sector in Brazil, for example, we have state level, federal level, etc., and different roles also. There is uh, 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 monitoring, fiscalization role, that there is enforcement role, and, uh, and maybe, maybe we have still to put all these uh, actors and players together and start to build something. Okay, what it means a forest restoration uh, project here? What you have to 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 guarantee inside the 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 land where the forest will be restored? What you have to guarantee around it? What, who is a part of this process? Who has to be included not only in the project itself? It's very important to include uh, the communities in the process of, the process of, uh, of restoration, with the seeds, with the monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But there is people around, they will never be included in this process. As in different other sectors, when we are working, for example, with, uh, with the mining sector or uh, uh, um, electric, electrical uh, energy sector, we are they are okay, but we will we'll, we'll create jobs, and that's true, but not jobs for everybody around. So we have to be very transparent, be understand that to not say, and, and, and the private sector is not responsible for everything, but maybe putting all these actors together and start a first draft of, of this, okay, what it means to do forest restoration in Brazil, for example. And then you have Brazilian actors, public and private, and, and we have a model or a reference, something to follow and to improve, of course. But at least we have something that it's a, a reference. I don't know, maybe some, some first ideas. That's great. I also don't have the answer for that. But I think we always need to remember that um, we work for people with people and that's a way to go. Yeah, 
That's a really great summary. Thank you. Um, so Amira, thank you for your question to the other panelists. <laughs> I want to come back um, um, to the um, to the uh, to the finance question um, and and you know how uh, how can people how much finance um, uh, can communities expect from projects? Um, you know, is there a is there a standard? Is there a, a, a sort of general percentage? You know, how how does that get worked out? And and what should people be um, should be benchmarking against? What's best practice? So Jane, I would say this is the one million dollar question <laughs> you you are asking. <laughs> but um, as far as I know, there is a lot of trials or studies trying to give a number to this question. But as far as I know, I don't know a final answer or a standard answer or answer where we can generalize for everyone saying, if you do this kind of restoration, doing this, uh, this amount, I don't know, this size of field, you will be having uh, this return on, on finances. So for, for my side, I, I, I'm, I don't know as far uh, as I know, it, I don't have a definitive answer. But at Morpho, for example, what we do is when we uh, calculate our project, there is a, a third that will go uh, to our operations, a third that will go uh, to our uh, science. But a third also that will go to the local communities through actions where they are involved in uh, in the seed collection, the land preparation, uh, the long-term on-site monitoring, etc. And the goal behind it, it may, may be obvious, but it's a very important one. It's to bring and give a sustainable revenue and giving a high price or at least a fair price. And there is a need to work on this payment up upfront of the project so you cannot wait until a project is looks like a forest to say yeah now i will be paying the the people working on it so this is how we do this is how we plan it and it's the um, in a way the, the the direction we are we are having and the vision behind how you build a, the finance behind the project we have um, and, and does it come up in methodologies if you're, you know, standard standard methodologies or anything like that? Um, and, and maybe actually, Catherine, we could bring you in here because um, I believe that, um, you know, one of your studies, um, you, you, you've you actually tackled this. Um, and so if you could, yeah, maybe just give us a little bit more on how uh, the, the findings of that um, can inform restoration projects um, going forward. Yeah, of course. Well, I think like Amira said, it's the million dollar question. And I think her answer was really perfect in that there is no real right answer. And I think that is a kind of underlying theme we have here about the importance of context, both ecological, governance, social context, and how anything you design really has to consider that. And so something that works in even where I am in Panama, Panama is a tiny, tiny country and something that works in one area of Panama might not work in another area of Panama. And so really understanding the context and designing things in a way that also allows for adaptation. I think um, Sibeli used the word recipe, which I love because a recipe means, or, you know, we always tweak recipes. We never follow a recipe exactly. You know, it's any sort of fat forest restoration project shouldn't be a prescription, um, but it really should be a recipe that we can adapt over time. And so thinking about um, the project that we have and the research we have on paying for ecosystem services, and I'm really focused on carbon payments. It is a little bit of a sort of wild, wild west out there in terms of voluntary carbon markets and setting prices and the manner in which you pay people for carbon. So I could go on and on about it, but just to give two examples of what I've seen here in Panama done is there's two methods of carbon payment schedules that are common. One is where you tie the amount paid to the landowner based on the actual amount of carbon sequestered each year. 
So the way trees grow is they will sequester a lot of carbon early on, you'll get this peak, and then that sequestration will slowly approach zero as the trees get older. So you can imagine a payment schedule then would be something where it would be quite high early on, and then it would go down, but also there's so much variability um, year to year. So it can be very inconsistent and it can be a little bit scary for the landowner because they don't know what they can be guaranteed. So an alternative, one other way to think about it is doing something called a flat payment, where based on research, we have you know, 30 years of carbon sequestration data, and we can take the average over those 30 years and pay someone an equal amount for the 30 years. And there might be some variation in growth from year to year, but they would still get that consistent payment. There are pros and cons to these two and other methods. I think some pros of a flat payment are that it incentive, they, there's a lot of good social science research, um, especially in Panama and Peru. Um, I know a ton in Brazil as well. And at least where I've worked is a flat payment is more likely to encourage people to participate in a program and incentivize them to join a program. Um, whereas sometimes a variable payment is just too risky for them. And so it's a little bit scary to put some of their land in forest restoration and not be sure that they're going to have a stable source of money coming off of that. Um, I like it for some reasons in that, especially again, I'm coming from um, the US and oftentimes, again, an assumption from from people in the US and probably myself included many years ago was like, oh, we need to reforest the tropics and like people should reforest the tropics. And we're assuming that the whole risk is put on the landowner. And, you know, I, as someone from the US, is, am not willing to take any of the risk of it not working. Um, but I think in some ways, a benefit of a flat payment is that it takes the risk off the landowner and it puts it on the person paying for the carbon. Um, but again, there's mm -hmm. cons to all of these and depending on the context of where you're working, one of these or another method might work better than another. Thanks so much, Catherine. Yeah, that's that's really helpful to have that very clear description of the different models. Um, I'm going to move on now to um to the to second challenge that we identified, um, which is ensuring science works for communities. Um, so um so yeah, I wanted to start with you, um, Amir. Um, you've got a great story um of uh, about date palms, <laughs> um, uh, where you had a, a massive scientific breakthrough um but um but only minimal impact in reality so maybe if you could just give a, a brief overview of that um so we have some context for for why we thought this challenge was important um and then we can uh we can dive into how that how that um is uh part of uh, should be part of restoration thank you jane so again i will come with my stories of date palm so <laughs> this is a <laughs> Uh, as a thing, it's just for me. Story about a date farm. So yes, I, as I told at the beginning, I worked on genetic diversity, uh, on agroeconomical uh, relevant species, and date palm. It's uh, it is a um, an important species in arid and semi-arid region, going from Africa to to Asia, and um, this the, the 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 countries and the region regions where you have date palm. Uh, production, you can expect that 20% of the population ha ha has the, the income from dates. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite important uh, culture and it's a kind of growth. And maybe we can discuss this in the, the upcoming challenges for the reforestation. When you have this weight of the economy, you have also, it's not a monoculture in a species, but in a monoculture in a variety uh, manner, which is the variety that will bring the highest income. So it's very important to have it, but it has um, the danger around it, which is a vulnerability to diseases and, and so on. So there is a big need to be able to improve these varieties, 
develop new, select new varieties, sustainable, resilient, and so on. But the problem is if you don't, you cannot um, differentiate male and female from date palm because there is a male and female in a date palm. You cannot do this selection. And the findings you are, you are talking about uh, were my, my findings for my PhD at the IRD. It's finding these famous sex markers when you can uh, identify the sex very early on, on the, the small seedling stage, knowing that if you don't do it, you need to uh, wait for 10 years around to understand, to know if it's a male or a female. So if you tell this story to a, a pound producer, you will not have any kind of answer, except can you go out, please? So finding these markers uh, was a huge thing. But if you cannot transfer it on the field, if you cannot give it to the, the, these products, produ producers, to the local communities living and making a living of the date palm, it doesn't mean anything. So the idea and the, the thing that was very important for, for us and for me, it was to be able to transfer this technology to an NGO. And again, this is the interaction about the different uh, actors. Give it to an NGO that will use it to plant um, palm groves and make it select females and make it available for local communities. So it's a tiny impact on the field, but uh, the story behind it, it's, it is possible. We can bring science to the field, we can bring results to the field and make it relevant to the, the people living from the species you are working on, on or impacted by your scientific question. So this is the, the takeaway of this, this, uh, this story for me, at least. Thank you. That's really, yeah, really, really helpful. Um, um, Catherine, um, I, I just wanted to, um, to to help ask you to help us bridge um, um, and from this on um, from your studies um, on engaging local communities um, and how scientific knowledge is is kind of helping to uh, shape um, community engagement strategies. Yeah, I, I I'm always. Um hesitant as a scientist to kind of like overstep boundaries. So I always feel one thing that um, I again love about this webinar is we have people from all different expertise. And so oftentimes I can only share what I know as a scientist. And um, I've also learned a lot um, in the last five years of engaging with communities and bringing science um, to communities and also, of course, made mistakes along the way and had to um, course correct. But um, some of the things that I think like are huge takeaways for me, and I know a lot of times we're talking about scaling up reforestation or restoration efforts, and it can feel super daunting and we want to do it really quickly. And I think what I've learned from the science is really the importance of starting small and seeing how things work and working out the kinks and then slowly scaling up from there with the right people, the right partners, the right groups. And even just thinking, you know, from a very small perspective of mine from what species you select, for example, um, to plant and even learning within the first two years, huge things. So for example, I was just in the field the other day and all these trees that we planted two years ago, they looked so good and it was so exciting. And I was saying, okay, perfect. So we have so many species that are great for this area that's really hard to work in. And then I was leaning on one and it started to shake. And I thought that's unusual. And I was able to pull it up and beetles were attacking the roots of this species. And I was there with a landowner and they were also kind of alarmed, but then he said, oh yeah, I've noticed all of the Meccano species are getting attacked by beetles. And, you know, that is such great information to know and to think about, okay, moving forward, you know, how does this species fit or not fit into the planning? And I think, again, just working with the communities and 
working together and solving problems at a very small scale before deciding to plant that species across big scales, for example, is uh, a huge lesson that I've learned. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, what a great story. <laughs> um, um, and, and scary story. <laughs> um, um, Bruno, I just wondered with your experience in working on large investment projects, um, are, are scientists' recommendations followed? Um, and so, you know, can you give us a bit of an idea of like what the current state of integration um, or leadership of projects, local communities and science, uh, how that is on the ground? And then I'll come to you, Sibylla, to give us a little bit more about what you witnessed. Sure. Well, I think there is a lot of uh, boxes to open in this uh, science uh, question. We could do a, a webinar only about that, maybe. But as I said, I'm a much more a, a practitioner than a scientist. But what I can say about what uh, happens in the ground is that uh, the successful cases are the cases where we succeed to uh, build this dialogue between uh, a, a knowledge that's from abroad, it's from outside, it's uh, in, a in, a, in a hard and difficult language sometimes. So when we, see, when we have success in translate that and have build a dialogue using this world, this wo these words and this, and maybe uh, um, building some bridges between uh, a, a scientific knowledge and a traditional knowledge. I think, I mean, this uh, uh, this story uh, Catherine just told us, uh, it's very interesting because sometimes we, and in in, in this, in, in this, uh, this the, when, when traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge, they, when they meet and they integrate, it's, it's quite magical because you, it's, 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 it's where innovation appears, you know, like it's something it's uh, in, in, the, in the labs, then you mix with something that was in the ground since centuries sometimes, but never really systemized or, or registered as, 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 an, as a knowledge. And so when it's possible, when, when we, we have success in doing that, it's, it's, it's when science uh, we can really uh, contribute, but, uh, another box maybe about this about this uh, question is how how to show that uh, science can be conciliated with different agendas on the ground because sometimes we have this um, uh, certainty that okay science is bringing the best solution and I will take this solution from science it's show it's it's proved that it's hundred percent more efficient because we know with all the experiments in the lab that it's hundred percent percent more efficient and then we understand that when it goes to the ground and interact with social economical dynamics political dynamics the, and the history of of this place uh maybe it's not the best solution so um we have to understand how to conciliate this, uh, this, 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 the sciences, uh, certainties with the social, political, economical reality, and also to be able to, to show to different actors with different agendas how science can be a part of their uh, an improvement to their agendas. And this mm -hmm. is very hard nowadays to do with politicians, and politicians are a key. Uh, uh, actors in all these processes, in all the large scale projects, uh, uh, public agents and public uh, bodies are a very important thing. And to bring science as a and a, a, as an element of uh, decision making, it's harder and harder nowadays. And we have as scientists and practitioners, we have to find a way how to show. Okay, you have a political agenda. But there is science can contribute to that, and with respecting all, all our, our our goals, our objectives, our ethical uh, and uh, uh, compliance uh, elements, we can also understand what's the political agenda and then and then conciliate that uh, and show. Otherwise, if it's uh, polarized, 
we won't we won't uh, win this this fight. So yeah, there is a there is something to to work maybe harder and uh, further on that for for us. I it's a, it's an auto criticism also. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, Bruno. No, that's uh, that's really 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 helpful. Um, Sibylla, does this align? Does this resonate with what you're witnessing um, in the field? Well, um, Rede de Sementes do Cerrado uh, was born within university, so researchers structured and shaped the institution's pillars. Um, and today we still have a strong connection with professor, professors and students. Um, and besides that, the seeds we use and the collection and process and methods have been refined based on analysis and tests uh, from the University of Brasilia Lab and uh, other research institution. Uh, also, the restoration techniques you, we use are tested and improved for different vegetation structure, but um, it is essential to highlight that uh, we value scientific knowledge always associated with the traditional knowledge of the peoples uh, we work with. Um, and uh, because of the field experience we have, we see that restoration, especially, especially considering the large scale we aim to achieve, operates on a very different and faster timeline than scientific research. Um, not everything done in academia reflects the same way in the field. Um, and so, as Bruno said, it is crucial for the university to dialogue with practice, uh, with those who are in the field, so the gaps can be understood and research can advance more strategically for restoration. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, um, Svel. And actually, that's you know such an important point there about including indigenous knowledge within this, which in some cases isn't even properly studied and isn't even properly kind of. Um, integrated into scientific knowledge. So there's almost sort of three aspects to this. Um, Amira, just to, just to finish up on this challenge before we go into the, the next one, um, you know, how how do you how do you balance all those three at Morpho? How do you build the strong scientific partnerships with universities, um, with the institutions, with the kind of politics side of things, and then also integrate those um, uh, the, the indigenous knowledge itself? Do we have four hours left? No. <laughs> okay, please just give us like two minutes, <laughs> the, the two minute version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is not one yes. million question, it's 10 million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm not sure that I will be able to answer everything, but uh, from what we heard, um, it's, it's a crucial. Um, debate and these crucial ideas and for me it's a kind of finding a balance but it's maybe um, a kind of at least a three beat dance because we have the the beat of the nature the beat of the science and the famous beat of economics and politics so the thing is we, we will need to learn how to dance so this is a first thing to have this at least uh, dance between us, but everyone is, is in the heart of these, this dance. And maybe to, to go back a bit, um, we are talking about local communities, which is, as I said, and all of us said, it's at the heart of the, the, the webinar. But in our mind, sometimes when we talk about local communities, we talk about people on the field or impacted in the field. However, local scientists, are a part of these local communities also, and they are a part of a solution in a given place. So they are a part of this big vision of involvement of local communities. As Catherine said, you can have amazing scientists coming from US, from the US, from Europe, with amazing ideas, but you have as huge scientists in the country with the knowledge, with the interactions with all the communities, so including and involving the, the, these scientists. It's, it's not a kind of luxury or option. It is also 
a part of the solution and the main part of it. And some few days ago, I was in Para and I met amazing scientists from Embrapa. So everyone knows Embrapa in Brazil. So they, they, they have gathered knowledge from decades and decades. It's an, a golden mine, a real one. Uh, and these researchers need a voice, but it's just a voice, as Sibel said, it's a voice when something is shared, where there is interaction and where, where this knowledge is a reality on the field. But there is, I would say, more need to give a voice and to be able to dance this famous dance and use in a way this knowledge and make it valuable because it is valuable and we can for example speed up the pace of the research we can speed it if we involve this knowledge gathered from decades of work and sometimes we say that okay research it's in the kind of ivory tour and we need to put it on the field but it is just waiting to be put on the field and in in our roles as a private companies or actors, it's to, to build this bridge and or, to, or at least to dance this dance with them. And it is, it is something that will be uh, very important for decision making in the future. Ka Catherine, you, to you talked about the choice of the species. It's very important because you never know. On the paper, the choice w is amazing. On the field, yeah. Amazing-ish. <laughs> so the, the, this is the, the importance of involving this broad definition of lo local uh, communities. And I don't know, the few days ago also, that we, there is this coalition symbiosis about the four big tech uh, companies with um, a let motive, which is um, make a common high quality standard uh, for forest restoration. And maybe our role also is, and more than maybe, is to maybe make this line moves a bit, involving the local community communities and saying that if you want a high quality standard, you need to have local communities involved in, in this process. So this partnership, this interaction between science, field and economic, it's, if I need to say it, it's the first condition for all of the success of any uh, restoration project. Absolutely. This is for me. I Thank took you. less than four hours, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I realize that we could carry on on this for a very long time, but I we have two challenges to get through, and we've got a lot of um, really interesting Q&A uh, well, questions to, to address in the Q&A, so I will move us along to um, the third challenge we identified, which is matching local communities' competencies with um, high integrity projects. Um, and, um, and I'll start uh, with Sibylla again, um, please. Um, uh, you talked about, um, you know, the RSC collecting 140 native seed species. Um, can you just give us a little bit more detail about how it's organized and why you um, decided to focus on seed collection in that context of, um, of local communities' com competencies? Okay, okay. Well, uh, seed collection is done by associations. Uh, they basically organize from the ground up the collection and processing methods with the support from Rede de Sementes do Cerrado, um, who helps them to structure the collection and build bridges between traditional and scientific knowledge. Uh, so the inclusion of these species happens uh, through a dialogue between scientific and traditional knowledge. And we decided to boost seed collection because of the advancement of the direct seeding method, which means dispersing seeds directly in the soil, into the soil. And um, with this direct seeding, uh, we can include more species and live forms like grasses uh, in this whole process of the ecological restoration planting. Um, Besides that, due to volume, community-based seed collection has gained uh, prominence and it is now seen as a strong point of direct seeding. So 
we see the environmental and the social importance of the whole thing. But um, regarding successes, uh, ecologically speaking, without a question, uh, the, provo the provision of grasses uh, and shrubs for restoration is a gain, because um, more than half of the Cerrado is composed of these life forms. Uh, the biome is basically savanna-like, so using grasses and shrubs in restoration projects is essential. And we were pioneers in bringing grasses to the market and continue to focus on increasing um, the diversity of the stratum. Uh, but talking about challenges, uh, one of the things that keeps us up at night is scaling the seed market. Um, the relationship between seed supply and demand is, is still very, very unbalanced. And today there are more than 25 seed networks spread across the country in different biomes. And all of them face the same bottleneck, uh, which is the market access and the seed distribution. And all these networks have a much bigger seed supply than it is demanded by the restoration market. And this is the reason why we are always questioning what is the solution for this problem. And uh, we couldn't let to mention that another challenge, challenge is making collectors protagonists in more areas of the restoration chain, not just collection. And we see that many job positions can be filled by committees, but um, there is still a lack of technical training and digital inclusion, uh, which makes this process slower and more expensive, unfortunately. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Catherine, I, I wondered if you could um, kind of broaden that out a little bit um, and, and talk about what you've witnessed um, in terms of competencies um, in your different uh, research areas. Yeah, absolutely. So I, so we, over the last two years, have been working with the Nole Buble people of Western Panama. It's the largest semi-autonomous nation group in um, Panama. And you know, we were really lucky that we started working with a social science um, that is runs a nonprofit here in Panama and had already worked 40 years with the communities. So when we were brought in to start collaborating on a reforestation project, there was already a lot of um, goodwill with the group that had been working there for 40 years. And so we've been planting um around 100 hectares using some 20 different species with over, I think, 20 something um, different landowners. And they have a ton, they have so much skill and information to provide. So, you know, they're the ones who are doing and being paid for all the work to fence the land and to do the fire protection and to plant the seedlings you know, that was, those were experiences that they already have and could jump right into um, without any technical training from us. And they even had a lot of suggestions on the species. So as a scientist, you know, I did my analyses and modeling and I was so excited about this suite of species that I, you know, based on the models looked like 95% likelihood that they, the trees would grow well there. And as I already mentioned from my story that they're not all growing well there. Um, and the people in the community were really great about vocally telling me that, you know, not all my models were so great. So it was a great, you know, um, check on my ego as a scientist as well. But I, yeah, I think like they have, there's competencies there. They bring a different set of skills than I have. They also um, bring in so much information that I could never have. And they also are able to see things and make decisions on the ground when I am not there. So just a really basic example of this is in our management plan with them, we have this idea of 
cleaning around the seedlings every three times a year during the rainy season to basically protect the seedlings from getting overtaken by grasses or lianas. And, you know, we have this sort of strict regimen around the timing of that. And there was this, last year was kind of crazy here. It didn't rain for a really long time. So it was drier, the seedlings were suffering. And we went out to check on the maintenance and most people didn't do the maintenance. And we were kind of surprised and asked why not. And they were like, well, obviously we wouldn't clear around the seedlings when they're already suffering because it's dry. And so this is offering a little bit of shade. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, obviously, <laughs> you know, but that sort of like give and take and their willingness to also tell us when we're completely wrong um, has been really great. Um, and I really appreciate it of their willingness to be so open and vocal about that. Yeah, that, that sounds really, really helpful. Um, um, so thank you so much um, for, for that. Um, I'm just moving on to challenge four because I realize we haven't uh, got a huge amount of time and I want to leave some some time for the Q&A. Um, we've, um, we've actually covered this uh, quite a bit um, in our um, uh, in, in as we've talked through actually so I think we just we could just keep it to one question for Bruno but the yeah the fourth challenge that we identified was integ integrating local communities into projects um, and we talked about this in in the other three challenges actually um, when it came down to it so Bruno I wondered if you just give a little bit of a summary on that um, but um, and also you know how uh, to talk a little bit about how often communities are leading projects um, and and how and how often are they integrated um, so, you know, basically are uh, talking about, uh, you know, that the idea of, of the, um, of actually making sure that they're community led versus or community based projects, rather than just having that as a, as sort of nice to have, <laughs> um, if you could yeah, give a little bit of a summary of that, and then we'll move on to the Q and A before, before we end, that'd be super. Thanks. Okay. It's true. Well, um, I think that's community based project it's a much more interesting uh, concept than community led project if we are talking about large scale projects because that's the scale of the projects is crucial in this thing because uh, i think I, I mean for small and, and because a large a very large scale project doesn't fit inside the uh, necessarily inside the community you know uh, but it can be based on that, but not necessarily. We don't have to search for uh, the community leadership in all the large scale projects, I think. The, 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 the problem is uh, somewhere else. Uh, for small and medium projects, it can be very interesting to, to, be, to, be, to have the community in the leadership. We have an experience here in Brazil, in the south of Bahia, with the Cocoa Farmers. They are they are they are small small farmers. They are a quilombola community. It's uh, uh, and and uh, there's this initiative called Reseed. They are they are working with these cocoa uh, farmers with a restoration process because they have the cocoa forest. They have another part of the land with other species. And for this, they are completely in the leadership of, of the process. And it's very nice, very interesting. Um, but in a large scale, in a large, very large scale uh, project uh, and with in this forest restoration connected with the carbon market in this, car this huge carbon farmers that is growing here in Brazil. I mean, maybe it's more interesting to, to build a, 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 a sophisticated governance system uh, with different actors, then build, uh, then try to search to put or to have uh, to advance the idea that the community is completely in the leadership of the process in the project. Maybe the community is not in the leadership of the project, but the project takes in consideration that this community exists. Uh, 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 the project is based on the existence of this community, and they are they in the community. It's a full part of uh, the governments, the, the governance of the territory, and not the governance of the, the, the project. This is very different, and maybe they won't be a part of the, the governance of the project, but they won't be a part in the governance 
that discuss the impacts of the project, the benefits of this project, the risks of this project. This is interesting to the community to participate in. So in general, in our work, for example, we try to build a, a governance system around the projects, not only for restoration, but also in other solar plants, uh, mining projects, how to build a governance system where communities are part of that, the operators are part of that, other private entities, companies are part of that, and public sectors are part of that. And, all, and in this governance system, we build three elements are very important. A common agenda for the future, okay. The uh, a territorial agenda, what we have to do and build to, to, to get uh, the, to to promote development in this in this in this territory, including the project, but looking beyond the project, uh, the the rest of, of this territory. So the agenda, um, a, a, a capacity building program that will prepare people not only to be a part of the pre project eventually. Some of of, of these people will, will have this vocation to be a part of that, but also prepare people to participate, strengthen local organizations to be a part of the process. This is very important because it's very unfair to, to ask people to come and participate if they are not uh, 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 prepared institutionally for that, uh, because it's imbalanced completely. So strengths, uh, local institutions, public and social, uh, uh, civil society institutions is very important. And then finally, it's something I not enter in, in, in the details, but uh, uh, a financial mechanism linked to this agenda to, to, to finance and fund this long-term agenda we have to promote development. And this and the governance of this financial mechanism is also a way how to put people, put communities in the leadership of this bigger process because they will be, they will be a part of the management of these mechanisms. And this mechanism, it will be able to catalyze a lot of different investments from different actors for the development of this territory. So sorry, it was a little bit quick, but- <laughs> no, uh, it was great, it was-, it was um, a, I guess that's, like, I think it's, it's really, it's really uh, important to, be, to, to avoid uh, easy uh, uh, speeches and easy, like, yeah, it's community led, I, I yeah. don't want, I don't like very much talk about greenwashing, but I think you understand. Yeah, it's like, yeah it's absolutely. Very, it's lip service. It shouldn't be lip service. The good, the good words to explain the reality. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, that that's really helpful. Thanks, thanks, Bruno. I just just before we go into the Q and A, and we we'll probably only have a few minutes on those. Um, so I ask everybody to keep their answers really short. We just got another couple of webinars coming up. Um, the first one um is uh, financiamento um de restauração floresta na Amazônia. Como o Brasil pode um, liderar uma revolução verde? Just, sorry about my um, <laughs> my my uh, Brazilian Portuguese accent, but um, but that one will obviously be in in Portuguese. Um, uh, and then the next one um, is going to be a how to identify high quality forest restoration projects with terraformation um, and restore as well as morpho. Um, if you would like, and the links are in the chat if you'd like to register for those. Um, there's also when you when you leave, you'll get a little survey, three questions on the um, on the webinar. Please, um, if you do have time, just fill that out very quickly. It shouldn't take long. Um, so um, jumping into the questions um, quickly, and if people could keep their um, answers very very short, um, so that we can get through as many as possible. The first one from Ignacio, um, who's been on LinkedIn Live, um, is how can we make forest restoration appealing to local communities without financial incentives, um, especially if they're if or when their basic needs are unmet? Um, Amira, maybe you want to you want to do do a quick answer to, to that one if, if anyone else wants to jump in. A quick answer. Okay, it's not very easy. You, you, you don't you don't give a, a quick a question for a quick answer. But yes, so how how can we make it appealing? It's it's a very um, important question. Um, I think um, in in a way we have answered during all the webinar how it can be uh, made appealing. And Bruno maybe used uh, uh, this. Um, community-based restoration. 
it's appealing if you feel you are relevant and um, you feel that this project will is is aligned with your your vision and your needs around it and when i say that it's i'm not talking about the economical because when you talk about local communities you have a strong link also with the forest and a need to be engaged and wanting to be engaged and wanting to become maybe and still the a protector of the of the of the land and it's a first thing because if you belong to the project and if you feel that you will be belonging to this project you are it's appealing and you uh, will be wanting to be involved in another part of the the the, the and the answer there is a need also to, there is an, a coming back on this investment. Uh, and I think it's, to think about it, it's, a, it's important how uh, the incomes can come, even if it's appealing without uh, having just the, the flag of the finance. But it's a, it's a whole, it's an involvement feeling uh, that you, um, you belong to this project, but you know that you will be, bene you will be benefiting from it. So I think it's not an easy answer. It's a complex approach, but I think all of us understood that the, the question to, to these issues are complex. The answers are complex as the questions. I think Bruno and Catherine and Sibeli will have also things to add on this uh, topic. Oh, absolutely, thank you. Um, and I, so I wondered actually if um, maybe there's a second question, which which perhaps um, Sibella, you could you could kind of any, add any thoughts to the to the first, but also um, answer this one from Ka um, Karine from um, uh, São Paulo. Um, considering the language barriers, how do organisations plan to genuinely include local communities in in projects typically discussed in English? Okay. Okay. Well, it's really difficult uh, because the language is really a barrier and uh, not only the language itself, but the way we think, the way we process um, the mechanisms, um, the knowledge and the activities and the way we see uh, life as it is. So... Um, in Rede de Sementes do Cerrado, um, we try to know the base, the basic development of related to associativism and cooperativism. So we can develop strategies and methodologies to try to reach uh, people and community, communities we work with and try to understand their language so they can also uh, be understood by the technicians and so on. Thank you. Um, Catherine, I don't know whether you want to add to, to either of those um, answers. Um, I honestly think that they both answered it exactly <laughs> how I would have <laughs> answered. <laughs> All right, super. Um, Bruno, anything to add before I move on to the next question? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So yeah, next one is from Renato and uh, he's on the LinkedIn live stream. Um, he's, um, he's asking, considering that restoration is a long-term project um, and maybe the people in the future won't be the same as, as those in the present. Um, how, how can we can engage that kind of continually with, with the community? Um, Bruno, that's probably a good one for you actually. Yes, this is a question in different sectors, I think, when you have this implementation process, it's very intense, and you have this engagement with different actors, and it's quite quite easily and, and, and automatically. And then when everything is on the place, on the ground and implemented, there is this risk of, uh, of uh, this the project's living his, its own life, uh, and and the disconnection with the territory is uh, there. But the, it's a little bit connected with, with what I said before. If there is a process when we build an agenda for the territory larger than the, larger than the, the project itself. I mean, uh, how, how to include this project in a, in, in a larger territory and in a longer process of development then and, and build the spaces or where 
uh, uh, all the actors will be discussing and implementing together this, this larger agenda. This is the way how, how I think we can succeed and have the community engaged uh, and in contact with the projects during the years following the implementation. Thank you. Um, do, does anyone have any, we've got one and a half minutes. <laughs> does anyone um, out of the speakers have anything more that they want to add to those um, before we wrap up? Um, maybe Jane, um, it's it's kind of a conclusion and maybe some keywords to take away from all the discussion uh, with the, the, from, from all the webinar we we had and it's so Sibeli talked at the beginning of a, a very important concept which is um, inclusive restoration and this is important but uh, I would say there is also maybe uh, so it it gives it gave me an idea about another concept which it can be the inclusive research also where you bring in it uh, the, um, the scientific knowledge, but also what we talked about, this, um, local, the, this local and traditional knowledge, this citizen science actually, that is a, a, it's a golden uh, mind for us to understand um, this process of restoring um, ecosystems. And when we say ecosystems, we have in mind, yes, the trees, but all the ecosystems and the human being around it are a part and a big part of this ecosystem. And I think uh, it's uh, it's our takeaway, uh, all of us. And if you have more, uh, I think we'd be happy to have it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Amir, and thanks so much to all of our uh, speakers. That's it. We're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you for a fascinating webinar. Thanks for attending. Um, and Morpho is going to follow up with some recommended resource. But um, yeah, hope to see you next on the next one. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jane. You. you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.